Let it snow, let it snow, let it pour on. You know, with all my heart, I believe we are a people and a nation that have truly been blessed by God. And of all those who give thanks to him and praise his name, our name, that means yours and mine, should be on the top of the list to praise and thank God. One of the most beautiful psalms of Thanksgiving, I believe, is the 100th Psalm. So if you have your Bibles open, please turn to the 100th Psalm and follow along as I read God's holy word. That's Psalm 100. Everybody found it? It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You know, if you're like me, it's not uncommon to compile a wish list at Christmas. I mean, how many children always, how many adults do it? I don't know. I like to do it. And then we draw up a list of revolutions for New Year's time, don't we? But there's another list we often overlook, and that's Thanksgiving Day. A Thanksgiving Day list of all for which we are thankful. Have you done that? Well, let me read part of a list that several housewives compiled. They wrote what they were especially thankful for. One lady, housewife, said this, for automatic dishwashers, because they make it possible for us to get out of the kitchen before the family comes back and for their after-dinner snacks. I believe this one was from my wife, I'm not sure, but it says, for husbands who attack small repair jobs around the house because they usually make them big enough and bad enough to call in a professional. For children who put away their things and clean up after themselves, there's such a joy you hate to see them go home to their own parents. Not true. How about for teenagers, because they give parents the opportunity to learn how to use an iPad and many other electronic equipment. And this one my wife put down also, for smoke alarms, because they'll let you know when a turkey's done. Now, our list might not be the same as theirs, but I'm convinced that if we begin to make a list, we would find that we have much more for which to be thankful than just our material possessions. Like you, you know, I'm sure, I'm really sure my list would include the major things like life and death and family and friends and the nation we live in despite all its flaws. But even more than that, I am thankful for my salvation. Amen? Amen. How many can say that? Raise your hand. Can you say that? Amen. How about our church family and the mercy that God showers us each day upon wonderful gifts? See, with Jesus, we have so much for which to celebrate on Thanksgiving. But has it ever occurred to you that no Americans were more underprivileged than that small handful from the Mayflower who started the custom of setting aside a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. Think about them for a moment. I mean, they had no homes. They had no government agency to help them build homes. They had no means of transportation but their own legs. They only Food came from the sea and the forest, and they had to get it for themselves. I mean, they had no money and no place to spend it, if they had any. They had no amusement except 
what they made for themselves. No means of communication with their relatives in New England. No Social Security, no Medicare. But anyone who dared to call them underprivileged would probably have ended up in the stocks. That's true. See, for they did have four of the greatest human assets that we could want. They had initiative. They had courage. They had a willingness to work. And this one, the most important, a bondless, boundless faith in Almighty God. See, remember that, that our forefathers had a boundless faith in God. That almost sounds strange today, doesn't it? In a time when powerful forces are at work in our nation to strip us from every reminder that the very foundation of our nation was built upon the conviction that we are one nation, what? Say that. One nation under God. A hollow declaration of independence proclaims we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain alien rights. And it ends with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So Thanksgiving Day, to me, is a distinctive holiday. It doesn't commemorate a battle or anyone's birthday or or anniversary. It is simply a day set aside to express a nation's thanks to our nation's God. That's what it's for. In 1789, George Washington made this public proclamation. I'll read a little part of it for you. But I want you to see the strong and absolute acknowledgement of the fact of God and our nation's dependence upon God. 1789. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is a duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God and to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to employ His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress, you get that? Both houses of Congress, both of them, have by the joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to observe by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of the United States to the service of that great and glorious being who is the benefit author of all good that was, that is, and that will be. We should read that more often and understand that. I mean, so this... Thursday, our nation will pause once again to celebrate Thanksgiving Day. Anybody here not going to celebrate Thanksgiving? We all are. And one would assume that because of the example of our forefathers, and because today we have so much more, that we would be extremely thankful people. But it is often the opposite, isn't it? You know, the more we get, let's be honest, the less thankful we become. The less mindful of God we become. And guess what? The more we want. I think that the 100th Psalm was written to deal with that attitude, to remind you and I of our need to be thankful and to maintain an attitude of gratitude. The 100th Psalm was written to the people of Israel. God said to them, When you come into the promised land and settle down in your warm homes and you have plenty to eat, don't forget me. I led you out of the wilderness. I brought you into the land flowing with milk and honey. You know, but it doesn't take long to realize that the people of Israel needed a reminder. 
And the point is, I'm afraid we need a reminder too today. I, I believe maybe God had us in mind. So when this psalm was written, did you notice to whom it is addressed? Look at it. The, the first verse says that it is addressed to all the earth. All of it. And the last verse says that it includes all generations. All generations. This message of thanksgiving is so deep and wide that it applies to every person in every area in every stage of life. You know, it's sad, isn't it? It really is sad that we are the only country in the world except for Canada and the Philippines that has a Thanksgiving day. I wonder how a world would be changed if suddenly all nations would begin to observe Thanksgiving. See, I think there's something about giving thanks together to God that breaks down barriers between people and brings about a unity. Much like that which occurred at the Berlin Wall when it began to crumble. I think also that there is a real danger in this season of determining our thanksgiving on the basis of how much we have. I mean, do you have enough turkey to gouge myself sufficiently? Do I? Is my money in the bank secure? Am I healthy? Are we really thinking about that way? And we let these things determine whether we are or aren't thankful? The psalmist says that all of these things may change at any time. They may drift away or burn up or someone may steal them. The only thing we have for sure is our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we have for sure. And that is what the 100th Psalm emphasizes. I mean, just scan the Psalms. Look at it in your Bible. In verse 1, you find the name of the Lord. In verse 2, you find the name of the Lord. In verse 3, you find the name of the Lord. In verse 4, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. In verse 5, you find the name of the Lord. See, the basis of our thanksgiving is what? The Lord. That's what it is. I don't know if you remember Alex Haley, the author of Roots. I enjoyed reading that book and seeing the movie. He had an unusual picture hanging on his wall in his office. It was a picture of a turtle on top of a fence post. A turtle on top of a fence post. When I asked, why is that there, Alex Haley answered, every time I write something significant, every time I read my words and think that they are wonderful, I begin to feel proud of myself. Then I look at that turtle on top of the fence post and remember that he didn't get there on his own. He had help. He had help. See, that is the basis of thankfulness to remember that we got here with the help of God. And that he is the provider of every blessing that you and I have. So now if we look very carefully again at at this psalm, we find that there are a series of five commandments given in it. Five. The first commandment is in verse 1. Look at it. Shout for joy to the who? Lord. All the earth. Does that include you and I? I think so. It means to shout with the force of a trumpet blast, a shout of joy to the Lord that comes from the very depths of your being. Maybe he solved your problem. Maybe he had given you the directions to go somewhere. Or maybe he has provided a a blessing and you realize that has come from God. So from the depths of your being, you proclaim and you praise him. A story has been told to me about a veteran missionary who came up to his pastor one day and asked that he had delivered his sermon. The missionary introduced himself and said, 
I was a medical missionary for many years in India. And I served in a region where there was progressive blindness. People were born with healthy vision, but there was something in the area that caused people to lose their sight as they grow older. But this missionary, he had developed a treatment which would stop progressive blindness. So people came to him, and he performed his treatment, and they would leave realizing that they would have become completely blind. But because of him, their sight has been saved. You know, he said that they never said thank you because that phrase was not in their dialect. Instead, they spoke a word that meant, I will tell your name. Wherever they went, they would tell the name of the missionary who had cured their blindness. They had received something so wonderful that they eagerly proclaimed it. See, when you think of that, then you got to say to yourself, that is what the psalmist is saying in our text, God's word. Suddenly you realize that God has been so good to you that you can't keep it inside anymore. Too many Christians are keeping it inside. I, I really feel that way. From the depths of your being, you should shout your joy unto the Lord. Second command is this. Serve, look at it. Serve the Lord with gladness. You notice something when I read that? Serve the Lord with gladness. It doesn't say serve the church. It doesn't say serve the preacher or serve the leaders or serve the organization. It says serve the Lord. The Bible teaches that if we witness on behalf of the Lord, if we feed the hungry, if we clothe the naked, if we do the work of the Lord, whatever it may be, we are serving the Lord. That's who we're serving. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto me, one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it, what? Unto me. You know, I'm not sure that we grasp that. Maybe we serve at times out of feeling of obligation or maybe even feel of guilt. If we don't serve, and maybe even because we want to draw attention to ourselves, and that's why we serve. See, it's natural for us to desire appreciation when we do something that is one, wonderful or worthwhile, I guess you can say. But the psalmist says what? Whatever you do, serve the Lord with gladness. The third command is this, look at it. Come before him with joyful songs. And then Psalm 98, verse 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto who? The Lord, it says. And that I can do. Can you? Have you noticed in these first commands, God has said, I want you to be happy, shout for joy, serve with gladness, come with joyful songs? Now just take a moment. Look at people around you. Did he look happy? Do they look happy? Or are they just sitting there with frowns on their faces? But look what the psalmist, the psalmist says. Come before him and serve him and, and sing his praise with joy in your heart. Then command number four is, know that the Lord is God and he is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. See, God took every bone, every joint, and he welded them together with nerve and muscle and covered them with skin and gave us eyes that see and brains that think and fingers that can pick things up. God made us inside and out. He made you the way he wanted you to be. You realize that? That God made you the way he wanted you to be. And he made me the way he wanted me to be. And that's a mystery, isn't it? When you think about it. I don't understand why, but somehow in God's province, he decided that he wanted a medium-sized man, not too good looking, not outstanding in anything, but just a father and a husband who would keep plogging along. So he made me. 
Ain't great. Made me. What a God we have. You know, but also, someplace along the way, he had you in mind. You, you, in mind. And he made you. An amazing thing, he is still making us. That is important to realize, too. He's not satisfied with the unfinished product. He's not satisfied with your temper. He's not satisfied with the weak areas of your life where you're giving in to temptation. So he's still making us. He's still working on our lives. See, God is your maker. And you are created in his image. Therefore, give him thanks for who you are. Then he goes on to say, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Yeah. I know a lot of people, and most of the, us want to be shepherds, not sheep. You know, it's not any fun being sheep. That's what we say. See, but the problem is we don't know where the still waters and green pastures are. And every time we go out searching for them, we end up in a far country. He is saying, you be the sheep. Let me be the shepherd. That's what God's saying. Let me be the shepherd. And I will lead you beside the still waters and green pastures. Just let me lead. And then command number five, looking at the text, is this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. In his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures for a week. I, no, it says forever, doesn't it? Do you have that underlined in your song? He endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. In the Old Testament, the temple symbolized the presence of God. So whenever the people came to the temple and entered the courtyards, they knew that they had come in the presence of God. Now, that temple no longer exists. But oftentimes, a place where we meet to worship God is called a sanctuary, indicating that God is there. You know what? In case you've forgotten, God is everywhere. You know that? He is with you as you drive on the highway. He is with you when you go to work. He is with you as you care for your children or grandchildren. He is with you every moment of your life. That is the source of our thanksgiving, isn't it? But I'm worried. You know, I thought about this. What if God began to treat us like we so often treat him? You ever think of that? What if God met our needs to the same extent that we gave him our, our very lives? Hmm. What if we never saw another flower bloom because we grumbled when God sent the rain? What if God stopped loving and caring for us because we failed to love and care for others? What if God took away his message because we wouldn't listen to his messengers? He wouldn't listen to his holy word. What if he wouldn't bless us today because we didn't thank him yesterday? What if God answered our prayers the way we answers his call for service? Think of that one. What if God decided to stop leading us tomorrow because we didn't follow him today? Oh, Lord, help us to be thankful that you do not treat us as our sins deserve or pray us according to our iniquities. And that's actually in the 103rd Psalm. Verse 10 tells us that. So as I conclude, I pray that this will be a meaningful Thanksgiving season for you and all your family and friends. 
And I challenge you to take time to read the 100th Psalm again. And if you heed those commandments, your heart will overflow with thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus Christ. It truly will. So this morning we offer his invitation. If you have a decision on your heart and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as that wonderful song was saying, he's everything. I pray that you will make a decision for Christ this Thanksgiving. And that you will confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you would invite him into your life. And thank him for forgiving your sins and dying on the cross for you. Now that's thanksgiving. That's a thankful heart. And he promises in the word that you'll be a new creation, that all things of your life will pass away, and behold, all things will become new to you. What a day of celebration that thanksgiving can be to you. And I pray everyone here knows Christ as their Savior. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't stop praying. I'm going to end with a, I know we have a little time. I'm going to end with a quick story I didn't share real quickly. Some men know it. Across the street right there is Ray Motel. He passed away a few days ago. Uh, his wife is a member of this church, has been a long time. And her and I used to pray here all the time in this church with tears in her eyes because he was such a mean husband to her. And she, she finally left him. He died. I don't know how many years that I've been praying for his salvation. I even had my brother-in-law come up from Florida, who was an evangelist, to go over there and we share the salvation again. And he still wouldn't accept it. But God sent a wonderful son-in-law who loved the Lord. And he's been there. He found out he was so sick, and they put him in Van Dyne to die. And his son-in-law would be there every day giving the plan of salvation. And he'd say no. And he wouldn't give up, tell him why it's so important that he could be into heaven. He said no. Then this young man got a call and says, you got to come right away because he only has hours to live. And he said, I had to stop everything I'm doing. i got to tell him again that Jesus is the only way he can go to heaven and have a life eternally with Jesus. And he went up there and witnessed again to him. And now the father-in-law could not speak. He was fading that quick. He said, I gave the whole plan again, and I asked him, please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, so I'll be with you in heaven someday, and some of your family. Will you do that? Just say this prayer, and he went through the prayer of salvation with him. And then he said to him, I know you can't speak, but if you accept Christ as your Savior, just raise your thumb up. And the guy went like, Ray went like this and died. See, that's what it's about for us. We got to be thankful, but we got to share God's love with other people and not give in to Satan's ways, but to share the gospel of Christ. I don't want to go to heaven and see someone up there and they said, well, you never told me about Jesus. That would hurt. This Thanksgiving, think of people in your family as you share around a meal, the story of Jesus and how they can be saved. That's my prayer. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.